Hey comp covers, so we are um, winding down on our s sovereignty uh, frames and our today's topic is going to be legitimacy. So this is 1.8, 1.9, and 1.10 of the AP Comparative Government Curriculum. So political legitimacy refers to whether a government's constituents, so the citizens of a country, believe that their government has the right to use power in the way that they do. If the citizens believe that the government has that right, then that government is legitimate. Sources of legitimacy for both democratic and authoritarian regimes can include popular elections, especially if they are free, fair, and competitive as well as constitutional provisions. So is there, do they have a strong constitution and do, does the government adhere to that constitution? That's a source of legitimacy. Other sources of legitimacy include nationalism. So is the country nationalistic? Does it have pride in its government and in its government's use of power? So nationalism is a source of legitimacy. Tradition. Um, maybe the country is like a gazillion years old, like the UK, and because of all this tradition, it's just the way we've always done it. It's the way we always will. It's always worked. It has a sense of legitimacy. Governmental effectiveness. So is the government effective in instituting policy? Um, do they respond to hurricanes? right? Efficiently and effectively. Does it respond to natural disasters? Remember, Mexico was struggling in 1985 because Mexico City had an earthquake and the government did not um, effectively uh, respond to that disaster. So um, it, it, the government was not legitimate. Economic growth. So is the country growing economically and is the fact that it's doing really well in uh, the economy a source of legitimacy. For example, China. China has experienced tremendous growth and as a result, the Chinese people see legitimacy in that government under Xi Jinping. Ideology, remember Mao's China. He was very much an idealist and his ideology was communism. And the fact that um, communism was something he really tried to uphold that and Mao, communism and Mao, was a source of legitimacy in China during Mao's reign. Religious heritage, like um, Iran, it has Sharia law, it's um, Shia Muslims or Shia Islam. And so there is legitimacy in that regime, right, because of its grounding in religious heritage. And then the dominant political party's endorsement, like United Russia. If United Russia or the Chinese Communist Party, these are both dominant parties. If they have, if the government has that endorsement, then it's legitimate. It may not be democratic, but it's still legitimate. It may be authoritarian, but it's still legitimate. All right, so sustaining legitimacy. So governments maintain legi legitimacy through a variety of processes and factors, including. So it can maintain legitimacy over time. Think of this as over time. Again, is policy effective? So if policy has been very effective, then um, legitimacy maintains over time. Political efficacy. So here's a term that AP might throw out at you. Political eff efficacy is a citizen's faith and trust in government. So it's very similar to the idea of legitimacy. Um, legitimacy that uh, says that uh, the constituents of the citizens feel like the government is appropriately using its power. Political efficacy is do, does the citizens have faith and trust in the government? So it's a very nuanced difference. So if they do have trust in the government, then that government can maintain over a period of time legitimacy. Tradition. It's the same thing like we saw with the UK because of gradualism. Um, the UK has maintained um, legitimacy through its strong traditions. Charismatic leadership, that might be a new one for you. This is where um, legitimacy is maintained through a cult of personality. So Mao, Mao was a charismatic leader, right? And so because of his cult of personality, personality he maintained control and legitimacy for decades. 
Um, you could argue even in the UK, the Queen, uh, Elizabeth II. I think she's in the, on like the 220th year of her reign. Um, that has charismatic leadership as well. And um, I will tell you, Nigeria is also characterized as a charismatic leadership because of the cult of personalities of the very strong men that have militarily dictatored over uh, Nigeria. And then institutionalized law. If we have a rule of law and a long history of a rule of law, then you can maintain legitimacy. All right, so peaceful resolutions of conflicts, peaceful transfer of power, reduced governmental corruption and economic development can reinforce legitimacy. So the fact that in Nigeria, we've had a relatively peaceful transfer of power since the late 1990s, right? In Mexico, same. Um, since we've had this peaceful trans uh, transfer of power where uh, one president does step down to another democratically ele elected president. That reinforces legitimacy. Um, and then reduce government corruption. Is the government actively trying to reduce corruption? That can reinforce re legitimacy. An increase in corruption, reduced electoral competi competition, and serious problems such as poor economy or social conflicts can undermine legitimacy. So China, right, um, it struggles with corruption. And so that has undermined legitimacy. Reduced electoral competition, like in Russia, um, like in China, um, like in um, Iran, has undermined legitimacy. You've got to have free and fair and competitive elections. Okay, let's move now from legitimacy to devolution. Devolution is basically where you delegate power from the top to more regional or more local governments. And devolution can be a positive and a negative. It can enhance or it can weaken legitimacy. For example, in the UK, the fact that the UK, a unitary state, has devolved power to the Welsh and Scottish parliaments actually enhanced um, legitimacy. So that form of devolution can be a good thing. All right. Um, so uh, promoting policy innovations matching policies to local needs, improving policies through competition, increasing political participation, checking uh, central power, and allowing better representation of various different minority groups. These are things that will enhance, right, legitimacy. Um, creating contradictory policy, potentially making policy implementation more complicated and inefficient and allowing inequality between regions, increasing competition for resources and exacerbating ethnic and local tensions that can weaken, right, legitimacy. All right, so, um, and I highly encourage you all in your short answers that you give to use those terms, right? Um, all these terms that we have in here, like um, political participation and um, matching policy to local need or checking central power or potentially making policy implementation more complicated or contradictory policy. Use those terms, right? So have this list of stuff in front of you during the exam. Questions about the integrity of election results across the course countries can lead to protests that may weaken legitimacy. So um, we've had that situation in Russia. We've had that situation in Mexico. We've had that situation in Iran. Remember the Green Revolution um, or the Green Movement that weakens legitimacy. All right, last set of vocabulary here. I know this is a lot of vocabulary for legitimacy. Political stability. So internal actors, which is a term you can use, internal actors. So these are um, uh, people who are in positions of power within a country can interact with governments to bolster, undermine regime stability and rule of law. So internal actors. Um, so this could be, for example, the oligarchs, right, in Russia. These are internal actors. Can interact with governments to bolster or, bolster means beef up or undermine, take down regime stability and rule of law. Contrasting methods to combat political corruption among the six coarse countries. Um, so we're gonna be looking at that. State 
responses to separatist group violence. So we have some separatist movements that we've talked about before. So um, those internal actors can interact with governments to bolster or undermine the regime. Uh, drug trafficking, like in Mexico, uh, that internal, those internal actors can interact with governments to bolster or undermine the regime. In Mexico's case, undermining the regime. All right, um, discrimination based on gender or religious differences are also something that um, could bolster or undermine regimes. Varied state responses to mass protest movements that oppose governmental policies or their equal uh, enforcement. So state authorities, state authorities of different regime types attempt to limit the influence of divisive and violent actors in their countries to attract more private capital and foreign direct investment and to improve economic growth. So um, some regimes can attract foreign um, foreign investment. Uh, and then there's some that, like in Nigeria, that there is a reluctance um, of the government or reluctance of companies to work with the government. Across the course countries, internal reform pressures from citizen protest groups and civil society can lead to the creation of new political institutions or policies to protect civil liberties, improve transparency, uh, address election fairness and media bias, limit cor uh, corruption, and ensure equality under the law. All right, so legitimacy, legitimacy, legitimacy. Let's go ahead and go into our case studies with the UK. So they have a long history and a long tradition of legitimacy that has happened gradually over time. And so um, for many years, uh, traditional legitimacy was rooted in the monarchy but through gradual change we're starting to see that traditional legitimacy is now rooted in the power of parliament again gradually over time another source of legitimacy is that their parliaments the MPs the members of parliament are directly elected Another source of legitimacy is its strong social services. So the effectiveness here of um, the National Health Service, right? That is a source of strong um, political, uh, if political effectiveness. They also have, because of their political culture of noblesse oblige, they also have a welfare state that um, a lot of the citizens um, feel are effective. So again, we're seeing the UK have a, a, a whole series of sources of legitimacy. And realize that the collective consensus, right, and this is happening after World War II when both uh, major parties collectively agreed consensus to move the country in, a, in the right direction, to become efficient and effective. And that's when they developed the National Health Service. And um, the spirit of collective consensus, this is where both parties accepted, remember the beverage purport, which was the precursor behind the National Health Service, this idea of a welfare state, a social insurance program that made all citizens eligible for health, unemployment, pension, with a goal of guaranteeing subsistence income to every Brit. This is similar to what the Chinese promised in the Iron Rice Bowl. And another long tradition is rule of law. Rule of law is, um, is a source of legitimacy. All right, moving on, let's go to Russia. So Russia, uh, it is uh, statism, which means it's a strong state which basically means it is an authoritarian state, right? A strong tradition, meaning a, a long history, a tradition, a history of authoritarian governments. And a lot of this developed because of its geography. Remember, it has geographic vulnerabilities. Um, the uh, North European plain, you can see here, because it's flat, um, a lot of invasions have taken place several times from the west through the north uh, European plain. For example, the Poles came across the, the European plain in 1605, the Swedes in 1707, the French 
1812 and the Germans twice <laughs> in both world wars, 1914-1941. So as a result, the Russian people feel like they need their governments to, to be strong and to protect the citizens. Thus, authoritarian governments have been, um, have been the issue. All right, so strong executives through their history of being invaded have been Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Alexander the First, and Alexander the Second, and of course Stalin in the 1900s. So they have a history of authoritarian governments. Um, and even though, yeah, they went to a democratic state um, in, the, uh, the, in the 1990s, in the 2000s, Putin has maintained legitimacy uh, based on authoritarianism. Three specific pillars. Stabilization after the chaos of the 1990s. Remember under Yeltsin and the transition to a democracy that just didn't go very smoothly. So the fact that he, Putin has taken on an authoritarian role and has stabilized the, the chaos. Uh, the second, economic growth, right? So um, remember Russia was on the verge of bankruptcy after because uh, you know while it was a communist state and then democracy and a capitalistic economy under Yeltsin was not really improving that much but we have seen slow but steady economic growth in Russia a rising living standard after decades of decline again under uh, late communist rule and early democratic rule that there was decades of decline and a restoration of Russia's international position in the world. Remember when they lost the Cold War, they were kind of um, humiliated and demoralized. And Putin has essentially uh, made Russia great again. All right, moving on. Let's go to our next country, if I can. There we go. China. So China's legitimacy is based in its economic growth and force, right? So remember, legitimacy refers to a government's uh, uh, constituents believe that a government has the right to use that power. And a source of legitimacy is economic growth. The GDP has grown 10% um, annually for over a decade, starting with Deng, who, Deng Xiaoping, of course, opened up China's economy from a command system to an increasingly free market system. And that economic growth, although heavily regulated by the CCP, has grown 10% annually. Um, political legitimacy also centers in the Standing Committee of the Politburo um, of the CCP. And even though it has been criticized, it tends to crush <laughs> any dissent like in Tiananmen Square. Um, another source of legitimacy is the Central Military Commission, which is the military arm of China that is under the, uh, under the auspices of the CCP. And, of course, um, uh, the Chinese uh, world power, right? Um, they have ascended uh, as a world power, a major member of the United Nations, a permanent member of the Security Council. Mexico. So, Mexico has also had a history of strong leaders, but also a transition to legitimate democratization. So, a real legitimate um, transition to to uh, to democracy. Um, so it is still using the Constitution of 1917, which is very much a liberal constitution. Remember that stability was brought to Mexico after a history of dictator after dictator with the formation of the PRI or PRI and the Sixcencios, which I misspelled there. Um, and so, you know, you basically, the Caudillos, these charismatic leaders took turns um, uh, every six years being the head of Mexico until 2000. And in 2000, we definitely see that transition to democratization with um, the decline in the PRI or the PRI and an increase in a multi-party system. So gradualism of democratization has taken decades and it does lead to a more consolidated democracy. Um, and with time, unlikely to revert to authoritarianism because it does have direct competitive elections with multiple parties. All right, Nigeria. 
So Nigeria has a history of charismatic authority because of their history of strong men like Babangida and Abacha. And yes, they were terrible, but again, they were charismatic. Um, and so as a result, there was some legitimacy there. Um, but in general, today, Nigeria has many challenges to legitimacy. Um, one of the biggest challenges is what we refer to as the Nigerian national question. Um, should Nigeria continue as, a, as, as one country? Um, because they have such cleavages within uh, the Nigerian society. And largely this is because of the various different ethnic groups that were arbitrarily put together due to British colonialism. Um, there is the Northern uh, Muslims and the Southern Christians. And so um, there's questions about whether Nigeria should remain one nation. Problems traditionally have been solved through military force and authoritarianism. So their constitution is weak. And so this is a source of, that undermines legitimacy. Um, constitutionalism is weak. There were eight constitutions between 1914 and 1995. So the acceptance of a constitution as a guiding set of principles has eluded Nigeria. They just don't have a lot of confidence in it because they change so much. And even the current constitution written in 1999 has been so heavily amended that people question the legitimacy of that constitution. And under the various constitutions, um, military and civilian leaders have felt free to disobey and suspend constitutional privileges that they don't like. So without constitutionalism, the national question has been much harder to answer. Corruption and fraud um, have also been a big problem and has led towards fragmentation or a tendency to fall apart along ethnic, regional, religious lines. Um, so let's talk about some of that corruption. There are two terms you should be familiar with, prebendalism. And this is where a political system, this is a political system where elected officials feel that they have the right to a share in the government. So a share of the government's money. So they just take it, right? That's prebendalism. Patrimonialism is a form of political organization in which authority is based primarily on one ruler. So patrimonialism is essentially a dictator, right? Um, uh, authority lies with one person, patrimonialism. And so I'm going to give you examples of prebendal and patrimonial <laughs> Nigerians. Um, General uh, Babangida, who was president of Nigeria between 1985 and 1993, and General Abacha. And he was president from 1993 to 1998. Last but not least, Iran. So Iran also has charismatic authority, um, but it is uh, also starting to achieve traditional legitimacy um, because its political processes are becoming institutionalized and formalized as the regime has evolved um, over the over time since 1979 also oil and the fact that it's a nuclear power uh gives uh gives iran a sense of legitimacy islam is also a source of legitimacy particularly shia ism right or uh shia islam that is a source of uh, religious legitimacy um and the ayatollah himself there's only been two in the history of Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, which is the current Ayatollah, and Ayatollah Khomeini, which was the original Ayatollah. And the fact that the Ayatollah has what is known as jurist guardianship, and that is basically the power given to a senior clergy member that has authority over Shia community. So they are basically um, the top leader uh, in Shiism. As a matter of fact, the Ayatollah's official t title is, quote, leader of the revolution, founder of Islamic Republic, guide of the oppressed masses, commander of the armed forces, and imam of the Muslim world. So he is top dog for sure. Another source of legitimacy is its constitution, 1979 constitution. It was amended in 1989, and it does mix a theocracy and a democracy. Um, and in the theocratic 
part of the Constitution. It affirms faith in God, divine justice, the Quran, Muhammad, the 12 Imams, a return of the hidden 12th Imam, um, and the doctrine of jurist guardianship, which I referred to earlier. The people rally around the government also as a result of the Iran-Iraq war. That was between 1980 and 1988. And when people had faith and trust in their government, it is legitimate. And when Iraq invaded Iran in 1988, a year after it um, had its revolution, uh, the Iranian people rallied around its government. All right, that ends legitimacy. I think we have one more topic left, guys. See you later. Stay safe.